The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Ms. Christina Danko is here today from Rutherford County Schools and she will present today on mindsets. So this could be, this could be an entire course, but she'll take about an hour and a half and look at it. And so um, she's presented our Summer Academy before. She's uh, been with us in the collaborative now several times and she does work in Rutherford County. So Christina, Take it away. All right, well thank you for that introduction. So just a little bit of housekeeping. There is a packet that goes along with the presentation and so we'll be using that throughout. So Dr. Clark asked me to um, come and present today and she gave me a phone call and this is the reaction that it kind of ended up being. Oh, thank you, I feel very privileged to be asked. Sure, I'm happy to do anything that you like. And I said, what, what topic would you like me to talk about? And she said, well, anything that can help the teachers work with other teachers. And I went, oh, okay. So I started a, I, like a little academy in Rutherford County this year where I've been working with new teachers to our district, new ESL teachers. And through this academy, I kind of got this idea. I keep hearing the same stories from my teachers. Um, I'm having issues with this. I'm having, and they're not instructional issues. They're issues when navigating what to do with other teachers, um, other teachers that work with EL. So I said, you know what, Dr. Clark, I'd love to put something together on some things that have been going on in my mind about how do you kind of navigate working with these teachers that affect our ELs and how do you navigate their mindsets in a way that's really positive and um, and she said well that's fine Christina if you want to do that just make sure that you do it where it's a really positive manner so I'm hoping that that's what will come across today so the goal um, I hope we reach this goal but um, I kind of sat down and I said, well, what do I really want to do? And I came up that I wanted to help develop a method to navigate and influence teachers' mindsets around ELs. Okay, so it's one thing to talk about mindsets, but navigating somebody else to believe a mindset is a bigger challenge. We can go over all day like, okay, like they need to have this mindset and they need to have this mindset, but getting them to believe that mindset, to take that mindset on, to adopt it, that is the challenge. So I'm like, I really need to give these teachers some sort of method, some sort of way that they can help do this with their teachers. Um, so you're kind of getting not maybe what you signed up for. It's not going to be an instructional approach that you use with your students. It's really going to be developing you more in a different direction so you can be a leader for ELs. Um, so my success criteria is that we will develop an idea of what is an influencer for change by discussing key characteristics. Um, then we'll explore the key mindsets for working with ELs by writing, and then we'll gain strategies for how to influence mindsets around ELs for a positive change by writing and discussing. Okay, so there's like two key things in there that you're really going to have to do using language. What are the two things, EL teachers? Writing. Writing. And discussing. And discussing. So if you don't talk, this kind of like flops, right? Like we're just going to be standing here and I'm going to be clicking through. So it is, an, you know, I do want you to participate. I do want you to share your ideas because this is us starting the discussion. Um, we might get through this and decide, man, we need more of this. We need more of this talk. We need more of talking about what's really happening with our ELs. Um, so we do need your input because I only get my view from working with my teachers in my district, but I want to know what the view is from all around. Are we experiencing the same things? Are we experiencing different things? Um, and then how can we work together to kind of work through those issues? 
Um, so these are my works of influence. If you haven't read this book or encountered this book, it's called EL Excellence Every Day. It's very teacher friendly. It's a great resource for actual gen ed teachers as well as ESL teachers. Um, takes you through like one chapter at a time. So it's been pretty good for me kind of working with a lot of teachers that are just developing knowledge around ELs. Um, this one's called The Influencer. It's about $3 on eBay if you don't want to buy it on Amazon. But it's written from a business standpoint of how great people go in to influence actual change. So I've kind of um, tweaked it a little bit so it's more education friendly, but this is a good book if you just kind of want to dive a little bit deeper into this topic. And then um, I also use this a lot for my frame of reference as I was building the presentation and it's called Advocacy for ELs and it's a TESOL book that got released by Corwin this last year um, and it's a really good resource for just kind of knowing what areas do you need to kind of focus on when advocating. So those are the three sources of influence that I'm working with. Starting us out, what do you think of when you think of influencer? Car salesman. Car salesman? Car salesman? I think of Instagram, you know, the girls that have the 30,000 or probably 1 million followers and they post a picture of them drinking a drink and all of a sudden the drink sells out, right? Influencer? What else do you think of? Someone who makes a change. Someone who makes a change. A good communicator. Communication. Let's try to get one more idea. So we got this idea that they, I mean, just them makes you want to do something. Right. And it can be positive or negative. It could. It could. You could be an influence for evil. <laughs> um, so we definitely don't want to steer you in that direction. But they do have some things in common. They do kind of motivate you to do something just by being them. They have that it. And they also motivate you because they're good at communicating what they feel like you need to know about. You know, be it they take a great picture and you're inspired by the picture. They probably pose 40 times for the picture. You know, but you know, just that one picture can influence you to make a change. Um, so we're gonna listen to John Maxwell talk very quickly, I'm not gonna play the whole video, on what he feels an influencer is. Today I would like to talk to you on becoming a person of influence. In your workbook, the first statement is important. Leadership is influence. In the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, I talk about a couple of laws. One is the law of influence that says the true measure of leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. The other law is called the law of E.F. Hutton that says when the real leader speaks, people listen. What I'm really wanting to share with you in this lesson and in this training series is to understand that, that leadership is influence. Influence is leadership. The person in any given group that has the most influence at any given time for any given reason is the leader of the group. So our goal, since leadership is influence, our goal is to increase your influence. Look in your notes. Increasing your influence equals increasing your leadership. J.R. Miller said, there have been meetings of only a moment which have left impressions for a life for eternity. No one can understand that mysterious thing we call influence, yet every one of us continually exerts influence either to heal or to bless or to leave marks of beauty or to wound, to hurt, to poison, to stain others' lives. So the goal of our training is twofold. Number one, help you better understand influence and number two, help you increase your influence with others. If you can understand it better, and if we can increase it for you, you're going to be a better leader. So let's do a little bit of what I call an influence inventory. All right. So we're kind of building this idea about an influencer. And he connected it straight to leaders. So for today's purpose, we need to start thinking about when we're influencing, we're leading. When we're influencing, we are the leader. 
Um, so go ahead, in your packet, there's a circle, and I want you to write down everyone you feel like you influence, okay? Everyone you feel like you have a direct impact and you influence on a daily basis. And remember, you gotta think in the terms of you're leading them. You're gonna see through this training, there's no right or wrong way to do anything in life. You just gotta find a way that works for you. Um, so I kind of reflected and I thought about, like, who do I really influence on a daily basis? So, I, of course, I put down my family. Um, so Joey's my husband, Lily's my daughter, and I feel like I influence them on a daily basis and I have to lead them, especially my husband. You know, he has to be led on, like, what do you need to do when you get home? And <laughs> um, when do you need to do the dishes? <laughs> um, I added on to my chart, uh, students that I teach. I don't directly teach students anymore, but I do lead teachers in teaching students, so I like to think I directly affect the students that they're teaching, so I'm gonna put students that I teach on there, but I know that I've influenced many students over the years. My mom, I, I influence my mom, I'm like, mom, try this out, or I think, or you can do it. And you know, I do influence her. I didn't put my dad on there though because I feel like I can't really influence my dad, he influences me. There's no telling my dad what to do, it's <laughs> my dad telling me what to do. So he is the direct influencer that's teaching me how to influence. Um, the teachers that I work with, I feel like I have a positive influence over. And um, I was actually in a school showing an administrator this PowerPoint, like, come on, give me some feedback. What do you think? Is this gonna like offend everybody? And they're like, you didn't add us on there. You influence me every day. So sometimes you even have your administrator, you might not even realize you might be influencing them and you don't even realize that you're influencing them. So I put that in blue because the administrator, as I was showing them, was like, why am I not on the circle? You influence me every day. So um, who do you influence? You kind of thought about that already. Um, why are you successful at influencing them? Take a second, maybe even turn and talk to a partner. Why do you think, pick somebody simple, pick somebody like a family member. Why are you successful in influencing them and leading them? You know, maybe pick your students. Why are you successful leading them? Mr. Tran, you influenced him. Let's see your parents. You know, didn't talk himself out of it? So we'll keep moving forward. You're kind of connecting now, like you're doing things, you're, you have actions that are leading people in your lives. Maybe it's that you're insightful and they like um, talking to you because you listen and you find a perspective. Maybe it's because you're a clear communicator and you're able to explain it really clearly and so they understand you. So you have those skills and today we need to put all those skills together. So um, we need to also think about what makes other people successful. So there's a couple leaders in my life, you know, I've had a couple principles where I would call them truly transformational. When they spoke, I was like, oh my gosh, okay, yes, I will lead, I will do, I will do whatever you ask me to do. And I've had principles where I'm like, oh, are you sure about this? You don't sound very confident yourself in this idea. And they didn't really influence me to make any change. I'm like, I'm just gonna go back to my room and keep doing what I'm doing. And when you figure it out, we'll, we'll talk again. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think about those people and I think, man, how can I be more like that person? Um, so this is Lily and Shamrock. Lily's my daughter. Um, Lily's been riding horses since she was four years old, and so this is her um, at five. And Lily went to a lesson, and uh, she was with a different teacher. They, they have like three teachers that teach at the farm, and she was with a different teacher, and throughout the lesson, 
I don't know what was happening, but by the end of the lesson, Lily had convinced this teacher to lead her around on a lead rope, um, to let her kind of go wherever she wanted to go, to just play silly games. And I'm sitting here going, okay, well, maybe if you try making her go in a circle, she can do it. Maybe if you try leading her on the rail and like walk behind her. Maybe if you try this as the mom, I was trying to give all these strategies on like, maybe if you try this, it'll make Lily do better. Maybe if you try this, I'm telling you, Lily can do better. Lily can do better. Sound familiar with your students? Yeah, yeah, maybe if you try this strategy, they'll do better. Maybe if you try this, they'll do better. I'm telling you, they can do better. They can do better. Um, and so this is Lily in her lesson. Like, what is that? I don't even know what that is. Like, because this was Lily the week before. OK? Perfect teacher. I mean, she's a wonderful teacher at that writing, uh, writing barn, the barn. She's wonderful. She teaches students every day to do wonderful things. But that was my, teach that was my kid one week before. OK, so that's kind of building this into the idea of mindsets, OK? And we'll talk about that. We'll bring Lily back up in a, a little while later. But there's three mindsets that every teacher needs to have when working with ELs. The first one is to value English learners' assets. This is on page two of your packet. And basically, the goal of this mindset is that every student has to feel valued and that they belonged. When this mindset is working inside a classroom, that student feels valued and they feel like they belong. The next mindset is to expect excellence from every English learner every day, OK? There's days that I don't even expect excellence from myself every day. I wake up and I say, man, this is just going to be a hard day. And I kind of dull down as the day goes. I didn't probably give my most excellent effort. So that's a pretty lofty mindset to expect excellence from them every single day. Um, and to me, this means that learning both has to be rigorous and it has to be very realistic for the student, OK? So it has to be rigorous for them and realistic for them. And if that's working, then they'll thrive and their capacity to learn will grow. So it's very simple, but you know, that's essentially what it comes down to. It has to be rigorous and realistic. And the last one is to reflect an inquiry about yourself. Um, and this gets to the idea of reflective teaching. OK, so how do you plan? How do you teach? How do you assess? And how do you reflect and adapt what you're doing based on the work that you're doing? Um, and many times, you know, we don't always think about all the parts. So it's very essential that you know that when you're inquiring, you have to reflect on planning, teaching, assessing, and reflection. Okay, so this is a couple, we're gonna go through a couple little talk points. I need you to think about yourself first because here's the key to being an influencer. An influencer always goes into a situation with positive intent. The true belief that somebody is not doing something ill because they're choosing to do that, that they're doing it just because it's unknown or unbeknownst to them or they had no idea how to do it right. So I have to build this idea that an influencer goes in always with positive intent. And if you don't do that, you're going to fail. OK, so if you go in with a negative aspect, you're going to fail with that person. So um, first question, have you ever found yourself lowering your expectations in class or lacking of one of these mindsets in the blue? Have you ever found that? And what mindset do you feel is your strength when working with ELs? You can do one of two things. You can talk to somebody close to you, or you can write down somewhere in your own binder, notes, whatever, on the back of the packet, some empty space, what your answer is. But you have to be communicating in some form, either by speaking or writing. So go ahead and talk about those two questions. The mindsets are up on the screen. Um, I mean, I feel like I always expect them to complete or do what I ask them to, so I guess I always expect excellence. Anybody have some insights? Did you kind of have one that you even struggled with sometimes? 
I mean, we're EL teachers, most of us, and, or we work with ELs, or we're administrators that have ELs, and sometimes I know I'm guilty of maybe not expecting excellence out of them every day. Um, you know, sometimes I get so used to, you know, scaffolding down the instruction so they can understand, I forget to push. Um, so that, you know, you're kind of getting this idea. Anybody else have like a kind of a aha moment of, yeah, I kind of had this happen? Well, we were t on that same line. We were talking about sometimes it's difficult um, distinguishing between making realistic expectations. And, uh, you know, am I making realistic expectations or am I lowering my expectations? You know what am, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it. And so that, that can be kind of tricky sometimes. So she's kind of saying, like, I'm making it realistic. Or am I making it realistic? Yeah, or so am you're I kind of just got that lowering it? And or kind of situation, is this really rigorous if it's yeah. realistic? Or is it realistic if it's rigorous? So it's got a little bit of ambiguous, you know, um, it's ambiguous. Um, so yeah, we all have those moments. The purpose of this for you to reflect a little bit on the mindset is to also realize that that happens to gen ed teachers. You know, they might be coming from a place where they really do feel like they're expecting a lot from them, but the reality is maybe they're expecting too much, they're not expecting enough. Um, you know, that they feel like they're valuing them because they make them fall in line. You do just like everybody else does. And, you know, then it's like, but did you really take the time to get to know them? Like. So it's really hard, it's a really hard line, but you have to go in, you're seeing, man, this happens to everybody, and so if I come from a place of positive intent, and I acknowledge the fact that we all have these struggles with mindset, then I can work to help you, and I can influence you to grow in this area. All right, let's try another one. Which mindset have you encountered a lack of most when helping other teachers? So not on yourself, Take a little time to talk with colleagues. What mindset do you encounter is the challenge for general education teachers or other teachers working with ELs that you encounter the most when speaking to them? Okay, go ahead. You can either write or you can turn and talk again. I'll give you about three minutes to kind of chat with your colleagues and be ready to share out because we want to see is there a trend? Is there one we need to focus on more than another? Right, right. not going to get up there. Boy, I had to lie to my mom yesterday. <laughs> I'm glad I'm in because I can sit and work with the two kids on their daily oral, and I'll pick out the two boxes that they, we finish together with support. So... Solidarity, we're in this together, right? Um, let's do just a quick poll just by a show of hands. If you encountered the first one that it's a value of English learners' assets that is the mindset that is missing the most, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. Um, expecting excellence from every English learner. All right. Um, reflective inquiry about themselves. That one's a harder one to pinpoint. Is it really the teacher isn't reflecting? But you know, you might know. You know, they're not thinking about how the assessment affects what they teach. I and mean, you're kind of getting this idea of where there there's a missing mindset. Um, I encounter the expecting excellence from English learners the most, that's the one that I encounter the most, and so a lot of my work is kind of building up that idea and that mindset for teachers that I present with. Um, so we'll get a little bit more into that, but you're kind of getting this idea like, okay, I'm seeing that there are some mindsets that might need some work, and now I kind of need the tools of what I can do to actually help this work. Um, so that gets us into, uh, I think you guys can answer that. Is it pretty much ILPs and chatting with the teacher and emailing? Um, anybody have something that's different from the norm? Email, chatting, face-to-face, -face, uh, ILPs, something unique? 
Um, I have one school that they send out like living documents. They're not really ILPs, but they're always like communicating like what they're working on and it's like a OneDrive document that's constantly being updated for them. Um, so the teachers can click in and see what's happening in ESL or they send their lesson plans to the teacher um, versus the lesson plans coming to you. So those are just some ideas. Um, what does it mean when an EL gets stagnant? They're not doing anything? They're not doing anything? They're not learning anything? Not learning anything. Anybody have a different idea? Plateaued. Or their environment. Their, say that? Or their environment. Their environment has kind of made them stagnant. They can't move forward. They don't have the freedom to move forward. There's, you know, things happening not just at home, but if, they're, if they feel they're not accepted, that could stagnate them. So, you know, maybe not feeling accepted at home or in the classroom can make them stagnant. Behavior. Behavior, yeah. So there's a lot of different things that can make our ELs kind of go stagnant, not grow. Uh, I think sometimes ELs intentionally try to become invisible in the classroom so that they aren't embarrassed by their language and then that can cause mm -hmm. them to become stagnant as well, if they're successful at becoming yeah. invisible. Yeah, absolutely, and I've even heard high schoolers say they do it on purpose because right. they want to stay in ESL, oh. making it a little bit too nice and happy for them in ESL because right. you're the only one that does value and accept them and <laughs> push them. So they purposely, right. you know, kind of, choose not to grow. If they're working at, the, at a frustration level, instead of working at an instructional level, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll become stagnant because their education is not accessible to them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's frustration. It's all frustration. They don't understand it. They, they can't, and they're not getting the input they need in order to give an output. Absolutely. So she said that if um, students are working at this level of constant frustration, they kind of shut down and they become stagnant and they no longer feel like they could give anything because I'm not able to do it anyway, so why should I give? That happens to a lot of our teachers. That might even be happening to you sometimes, <laughs> right? You know, like I'm always at this frustration level. I don't feel like I can give anymore. I don't feel like I can do anymore. I even encountered a teacher the other day. Um, I was, and we can't repeat this, guys, okay? So I got two Rutherford, I got two Rutherford County, like, ones, but um, I was working with a teacher, and she just broke down into tears. Um, and it was not an ESL teacher, it was a gen ed teacher, and she said, I just don't have anything left to give. Oh, where do you go from there? Like, I'm just like, oh, okay, um, well, that's what I'm here for, you know? <laughs> like, but you do have those moments and you're gonna encounter these hard conversations where you get a teacher that just flat out tells you, I have nothing left to give. And you have to figure out a way, well, how can I get you to give a little bit more so they do feel valued? How can I get you to give what's left of yourself and how can I reward you and support you so you can give? Okay, so again, we're going in with positive, intent. Sometimes we don't know what's on them. Uh, we, we're big on writing I can statements on the board and trying to get the kids to believe that. But I have a lot of kids who immediately say I can't. Okay. And that's their mindset and that's where they're stuck in the I can't. And that's a whole nother like PD, right? Like mindset issues for kids. Like the, I, the whole idea of I, they go I can't and you're like you can't yet but you will. <laughs> By the end of the week we're going to get there. Um, I just did a PD yesterday on content and language objectives and really being transparent to the EL's what's expected of them so that they know what to do to be excellent. Um, because they just you have to make it that clear for them. So yeah, definitely those, and they get that belief after a while. So you know, you have to kind of change some different ideas with them. Different PD, but we can bring that one up next time, right? Um, what are some ways you prevent this, this in your school or classroom? Are you doing anything to prevent stagnation of EOs, like just them becoming stagnant? Um, I know we've been really focusing on our long-term English learners in Rutherford County, and so like all our talks have started in elementary school, like 
well, we got to catch them at fourth grade so they're not turning into long-term English learners the next year. So there might be things that you're kind of putting into place, but it really does take a lot of work with gen ed teachers that are encountering these students because the reality is they're only with you one hour, maybe two hours. So it's like we really do have to build these mindsets further than ourselves. Okay. So we're kind of getting the idea that we have three key mindsets when working with ELs, and this is the mindsets that the adults working with the ELs need to take on. The first one, that you have to value an English learner's assets. The second one, you do have to expect excellence every day from an English learner. Um, and the last one, that you have to reflect and inquiry about yourself, both in your instruction, your planning, your assessing, and um, your teaching. So, moving forward, back to Lily. Lily and Shamrock, trying to figure out the puzzle of Lily and Shamrock. How come Lily was able to look like this the week before and the week later she was just a mess and running around and being led on a horse? And I remember I was trying to give all those strategies. Why don't you try leading her on the rail? Why don't you try um, having her do circles and you stand in the middle so she's kind of like in a smaller area with the horse. Maybe that won't be as scary. Let's try. And so I was giving all these strategies and the teacher's like, no, no, we got this, we got this. We're having a fun little lesson. And I'm like, oh man, I paid a lot of money for this. Okay. <laughs> um, I realized I, me giving those strategies did nothing. And the reason why is my, the teacher that was working with her was stuck and wasn't believing that there was excellence every day in every child. So she was teaching my student like a five-year-old. I mean, that's okay, right? She is a five-year-old. She was teaching her like a five-year-old. This is what we do for five-year-old lessons. I lead them on the rail. We play the little games. I try to keep their attention. And she wasn't really that my child had different assets that another five-year-old at the barn might not have. And so that for her to be excellent in that lesson, she had to have a different plan that was more realistic and rigorous for my daughter. And until I got her to believe that five-year-olds could do that, I could give every suggestion in the world. And it wasn't any fault of her not wanting or caring. They didn't work because I didn't change the mindset. I would have had to do some work in getting her to believe that my five-year-old has abilities that 10-year-olds do when riding horses, and that's okay. You can recognize these things in all children and kind of make your lessons different, and you don't have to just teach to what a five-year-old does in a lesson. Okay, so that's my personal story, but we're kind of getting to this idea that sometimes you don't have a strategy issue, you have a mindset issue. In fact, I might even challenge to say that you have to fix the mindset before you give the strategy, because they won't be ready to hear it if they don't have the right mindset. Um, so mindset is where we're going. So getting you to the tools now. Influencer for change, we're coming back. We're gonna give you the strategy to get you there so that you can possibly influence these teachers to believe in the mindsets we know are so powerful for ELs. So the first thing that you need to know about an influencer is one, that they understand why people do what they do. They understand why people do what they do. They can look at a person and kind of Think about what behavior's motivating them, why are they making the choices that they're making, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is they understand what makes them act differently, okay? Why are they making this choice over this choice? What's motivating them to make this choice? Um, and then third, they understand how to systematically create they have an understanding of how to systematically create rapid, profound, sustainable change in key behaviors. Because here's what happens, and I've noticed this even in my coaching. What you don't follow up on, just giving one suggestion isn't enough. Because then what happens, I come back and they're like, oh, that didn't work and I didn't know how to make it work. Something fails in the suggestion. Something fails in the strategy. Something keeps them from doing these things that we know are so powerful. And so you have to figure out how can I do it quickly? How can I make it profound that they want to do it? And how can I make it sustainable for the teachers so they can constantly try this out and have this belief 
belief constantly. And that's a pretty lofty goal, but that's going to be what we get to when we get to that method. Okay, there's three keys to influencing. First, you need to focus on the problem or need. Ugh. We already know that we are kind of built this idea, what do we think the problem really is? It's not a strategy, it's not an instructional approach. What do we think the core problems are when advocating for our ELs and making sure that they start to grow and thrive in a classroom? That it's really mindsets, right? You got to do a little bit of work on mindsets first. So kind of keeping that, you can apply this to other areas, but for today's perspective, we're kind of applying it to this idea of mindsets, that this is a problem or a need that we need to reinforce and influence for change. Um, then you have to identify your mindset or behavior to solve the problem. So here's some keys to identifying the behavior. So if you're a note taker, this is a place to take some notes. Um, the problem sometimes will be very obvious in your face. Okay, but other times the problem will be seen within actions of the person. So not that they flat out come and tell you the problem, but you're seeing the problem. Okay, and sometimes when you're looking for what the solution to the problem might be, you might need to think about what we call posi positive deviance. Okay, if, and what I mean by this, if she is growing my student and she is not growing my student, what is she doing that's different from this, this teacher? And so we would call her a positive deviant, okay? I need to dig into what she's doing and I need to figure out what's motivating her to have success more so than what strategy is she using. Like, let me have a conversation. Maybe not focus so much here and focus on the one that is successful with my student and get some insight into what is working. Okay, so you could kind of go about it that direction. The last key to influence is that you engage in all or some of the six sources of influence. Um, and an influencer will actually use all six. Um, but it might not be possible to use all six. So as long as you're using some, most people only use one. I can guarantee you 80% of the population uses about only one influence. And it's because it's the influence that feels most comfortable for you. Um, so in order to use more than one, you're going to have to use some that feel really uncomfortable. Um, and you're going to have to practice using those other sources of influence. All right. So we're going to go into the six sources now. Okay, I've kind of categorized them into purple, green, and blue. Colors are a very great strategy for ELs because it helps them visually see. So look, we're adding some things in there. Okay, so I categorized these into personal. Okay, so they're purple, personal. Very, it's my favorite color, so it's very personal to me. Um, so we got motivation and ability. So motivation, um, when you're working in the realm of influencing somebody's personal motivation, you need to help them find joy. You need to help them find joy. Um, you need to allow them to have a choice. That helps them find joy. If you just tell them that the only thing that you can do is this and there's no other choice, that doesn't allow them to find joy. But sometimes when you give them more than one choice and they get to choose and they feel like they took part in that choice, they naturally start finding some joy in that choice. Um, you need to have them connect to your own experiences of struggle, of success. Um, so you have to kind of connect to experiences either their experiences or your own experiences. And you have to kind of build this idea of a story, kind of like what I'm doing right now when I've kind of told you my story of Lily on the horse, okay? You gotta engage them in a story to make them want to kind of follow you, get to know you. Um, you have to be curious and you have to want them to be curious about you. Now here's where I thought I could go really wrong because it almost sounds like I'm teaching you how to control somebody, but remember, we're using our powers for good and not evil. We all agree, right? We're all team light side, no dark side. So, you know, we're teaching you these strategies because, you know, you really do need them when you're working with other people. Um, and you might even be doing this with your own students. If you really sit there and reflect, you probably tell a story to your students to get them to engage in a lesson. 
you know, you probably um, tell them about your experiences, you want to hear about their experiences. I mean, we do it with our kids, so it must not be too bad. Um, so let's go on to the next one. The next source of influence is personal ability, okay? Personal ability. This is when you get into this idea of is it a will problem or a skill problem, okay? Do they just not want to do it or do they not, do they not know how to do it? You have to focus on small spurts. Small spurts, you don't do it all at once, just small little spurts, one little thing at a time. Okay, you gotta provide immediate feedback and sometimes you have to build up emotional skills with that teacher because they're feeling like they don't have enough or they're feeling like they don't need to do this. So you gotta kind of propel them and build their emotions around what you're trying to get them to do. So maybe it's just a small goal of like, I just need you to be really clear when you're communicating um, what's required of them for homework. Let's try, what do you think? Here's two choices. Um, we could either write it down for uh, Jose, or maybe you um, have him get it from a friend, have a friend to check in to get what his homework is. Which one do you feel like would be best for Jose? Hmm, I don't know, I just kind of feel like he needs to write it down. Okay, well then, um, as soon as he comes in the room, can you remind him right away to write it down? I think that would work. Yeah, he could totally write it down. Just remind him as soon as he comes into the room to, to write it down. I think that'll really help him. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I really think that I could do that. Yeah, as soon as they come in, I'll say, go on, Jose, you know, to write down your homework. Okay, and then you kind of check in, like, how's that working? Is the check-in kind of easy or is the check-in kind of hard? Is it hard to remember that? Is it easy to remember that? Are you having difficult, you know, so you gotta check in on that little small goal. A lot of times we give the suggestion, but we don't ever go back to check in on, hey, what's the feedback on this goal? Like, is that working? Is that not working? Can we change it up? Do we need to try something different? Okay, now we're on to social motivation. Okay, so social motivation is, um, to lead by kind of turning the mirror on yourself. So if you know that you want them to kind of master a behavior or mindset and you're not exhibiting that mindset to them, you're not displaying what that looks like to them, then it's really hard for them to get what you're talking about. So um, I was working with a group of teachers at an elementary school and they said, I'm just so distraught because my kids are doing these wonderful things in class and then like, I don't even think that the teacher realizes what they can do. And I said, well, how often do you show the teachers what's happening in your class? Oh, okay. Well, well, let's think about that. Maybe you could try to show them what it looks like. What if you sent the work back and on the back you put the strategies that you use to get them to do this? And you said, look at this amazing thing that Sandra accomplished. And guess how I did it? I did it by sentence stems or paragraph frames. Why don't you try it out? All of a sudden, you're showing them what is the possibility and then what you use to get, well that starts a conversation. Oh, tell me about, okay, you put this in my box. What do I need to do with it? Oh, you know that, what that, I was just giving you that because that was Sandra's work and I was so proud of what she was able to accomplish. And now you've been telling me a lot about how she can only write a sentence or draw a picture. I wanted you to just see that she wrote a paragraph. You want to know how I did it? Yeah, how'd you do it? Yeah, all I did is I used a paragraph frame. Do you know what that is? Totally different than me saying, hey, um, I'm having difficult with Sandra just writing a sentence. Oh, you should use paragraph frames. See the difference? Okay, um, so that's social motivation. And then also you gotta kind of discuss the undiscussable, you know. Maybe, uh, maybe just one sentence isn't a great expectation. Let's kind of talk about that. Um, the next one we'll go on to is social ability. Social ability involves you encouraging them. And the way that you encourage people is you have to kind of get them to see that they need help from others. That they need to have interdependence instead of independence. 
They need to work with others. They need to work with you. They need to see the value in working with you. Um, and you have to build this idea that there's solidarity within the group. Like kind of when I came in here and I'm like, come on guys, we're all in this together. Don't we all have the same problems? Aren't we all having the same issues? We can solve this problem. All of a sudden we have this idea that we're a solid group all working together. And so I'm kind of engaged in this because I have this problem too and you might be giving me the solution. Um, so that is social ability. Okay. Structural motivation is when you kind of build this idea of incentives or rewards. It is the third one. It is the one that you want to go to last. Okay, you want to build up their ability to inwardly want to do this, the intrinsic motivation, but when you get to this one, structural motivation might be extrinsic, that there needs to be something in place that the teacher's kind of rewarded for doing a behavior that you're trying to get them to do. Um, and you have to think of not the end result. And this is very key. A lot of times you just want the end result. I want Sandra to write a paragraph in your class. Instead, you have to think about the behavior. So you have to reward the teacher when they use the behavior you want, not when they get the end results you want. So if the teacher kind of says good morning to a student, and maybe that was something that you talked about, you know what, for the next week, why don't you just try asking Sandra like um, what she did last night when she comes in? I think that might build a connection to you. And the end result is that Sandra feels comfortable in the room, right? That Sandra feels like she's valued. Well, that might take a half a year. We can't wait for the end result, but we need to start acknowledging the mini step along the way and say, you know what? Um, Sandra's been telling me about how you've asked her about um, how she, what she did every night, and that's really, really made her feel great. Uh, you know, she's loved sharing those moments with you. I just thought you should know that. That, you know, that means so much to her that you asked her what she did last night. It meant so much that she told me about it, so I thought I had to share it with you. Okay, so this is a form of structural motivation. You're changing the way things are kind of structured. Um, and less is more. You don't have to go overboard in this area. Less is definitely more in this area. The last one is structural ability. And this is where you have to make the invisible visible. If you want them to truly know that they can do things, you have to show them when they do things. Okay, so it's very invisible in your room. You have to make it visible to all teachers. You know, so if they're doing like a cool speaking activity, record it and send it to the first grade team and say, look what your first graders did today. I did this by um, doing academic conversations and we were trying to create and pose ideas and they were so excited and I was so proud that they talked. Um, let me know if you wanna know more about this, but I wanted you to see how much they're talking. Okay, it's very invisible in your room, but if you can make it visible, they start engaging in it and wondering what is this and how do you do it and what's the structure. So you gotta make the invisible visible. Um, you have to sometimes change their space. I meet with some of my teachers at Starbucks because they just will not produce anything if they're within their rooms, okay? So we have to like go into a separate space that's neutral, that they feel comfortable, that they can kind of engage with me. Um, so you might need to like even offer to kind of, hey, I'd love to go get coffee after school and chat about like what trouble you were having with Jose, would that be okay? Because changing that space might get you a different conversation than coming to their classroom or them coming to your classroom. Um, and sometimes you have to control the data stream. And here's what I mean by this. Internet is wonderful, but internet is very scary. So if you're trying to get them to have a certain behavior and they start Googling what you're talking about and they find something opposing to what you're saying, it undoes what you just did. So if you don't want that to happen, you need to be the one controlling the data going to that person. And what I mean by that is if you want them to use a certain strategy, you don't say go search the strategy, you send them what you want to know about the strategy. Because if they search it, they might learn it a different way than what you intended it to be learned. You get what I'm saying? Okay. 
So you probably need to control the data stream, not say, oh, just kind of look up sentence stems. Well, they might look up sentence stems and they're really bad. You know, so you need to control the data stream. You need to control where they're getting their information from. All right, so those are the six sources of influence. All right, another way to think about it for the purple, personal motivation, you need to help them find joy. Personal ability, you need to help them learn how. <laughs> Social motivation, you have to give them praise. You have to let them see the inspiration. Social ability, you have to give them support. Support from you, support from others. Um, structural motivation, you have to give them some incentive and reward them for doing what you want them to do. And structural ability means that you might have to actually change the environment that they're in. Okay, and I know that sometimes your hands are tied and you can't change like all of the school environment, but you can do little tweaks even to their classroom environment or even where you're meeting with them to kind of talk. All right, ready for the method? Okay, the circle is you kind of reflecting on the first key, which is what is the problem or need? Okay, so first bubble is problem or need. Then you have to figure out what mindset or behavior do you want them to take on? What's the positive behavior? What's the mindset that they truly need to develop in? Okay, so that's your next step. And then you just easily kind of connect your ideas for what type of social influence you could use. And remember, you don't have to use all six. If you use all six, it's gonna be very quick, but you might only be able to use one or two in the beginning, and then you kind of build from there. But it's a place for you to kind of jot down your ideas. Well, what can I do to help them find joy in this? What can I do to help them learn how? What can I do to help inspire them? What can I do to give them support? Um, what can I do to you know, reward them for what they're doing? What can I do to help change the environment? Okay, so it's just a quick um, way to jot your ideas. Okay, ways they get stuck. You have to recognize how they get stuck. So for excellence from every English learner, I think that's the second box. Um, ways people get stuck is sometimes they are meeting them where they are too much and they're not challenging them to the next level. Okay, another way that people get stuck is they're trying to protect them from struggle. They don't want, to, want them to struggle in their classroom. They want them to feel safe. And so because they're protecting them, um, they never push them to be excellent. And sometimes they get stuck because they're too busy sorting and tracking students. The effort of sorting and tracking them and labeling them as EL and saying that they're going to this class at this time and I don't have to worry about this or that is a, in an effort, even though it's a great tool for reflective teaching, sometimes um, makes this mindset, um, people get stuck without this mindset. Okay, those are just a few of my ideas. Go on to the next one. Um, valuing English learners as assets. That's the first box on your packet. Um, sometimes people get stuck because they miss their own cultural lens. I know, and I have to acknowledge, I do not have the same background as EL students. I don't even speak another language. People ask me all the time, Christina, do you speak another language? And I'm like, no, I never bothered to learn another language. I was learning about other stuff. And that doesn't mean that I am not a good EL teacher, it just means that I have to be really aware that my culture is not their culture. Um, and sometimes they get stuck not knowing their own cultural lens. Um, sometimes they assume one language diminishes another language. I really need them to learn English, and until they learn English, I don't know what they're gonna do. Instead of saying, hmm, I wonder what they know in Spanish. Um, maybe they know something in Spanish that I could transfer to English. Very simple shifts in mindsets, right? Um, and they rely on assumptions that they just kind of, oh man, you know, uh, I, I asked her what she uh, did for Day of the Dead, and, and she just kind of looked at me. <laughs> you know, they're working off that assumption of culture instead of really asking them, well, what are you gonna do on fall break? Or what do you do at the end of the month? What celebration do you have? Instead of being curious, they kind of make the assumption that they celebrate that, and maybe 
I have no idea what you're talking about. And now you made me feel like I'm not important to you because you're just assuming that I have this culture that I don't have. Um, and it can go the opposite way. They assume they celebrate a certain holiday and they really don't celebrate. Um, so sometimes they try to be overly cultural and they just really miss the mark and sometimes they just make assumptions not thinking about culture. You gotta figure out how they're getting stuck, what the problem is, and then how do you build up that mindset? Mm -hmm. I was gonna add, could it also be the assumptions of their, what culture they come from and how they're gonna perform in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Because I've had teachers who will say, oh, oh yeah. he's, he's Chinese, so he should be really he good. should be fine. Yeah. And I'm like, no, he's going to need support. So she said she'd like to add one to the list. Maybe they have an assumption from their culture of how they should perform academically. Um, I know I've had teachers say, well, I saw on my roster I had a lot of Hispanic boys, and good luck, because they're, they're crazy. <laughs> And you're like, um, not all of them are great. Have you like, have you have you met them yet? <laughs> you know. So sometimes when they get stuck in this area, they're focusing on one area more than another. So they're only focused on teaching, the teaching lesson part. They're not thinking about does the teaching relate to the assessment. Um, they're not. They kind of blame students' families before looking at their own instruction. I met with a group of high school teachers, and they uh, basically told me that the reason why the students were failing was because they just didn't want to be in school, and they weren't engaged in school. And so until we could fix their engagement or wanting to be in school, there was nothing that they could do. Well, you know, that, that's a problem that I got. Maybe we need to focus in on what you're teaching to see if we can make that engaging. Um, but they tend to just not reflect on themselves. They just blame somebody else. Um, I see this with gen ed teachers. I see this with other teachers. I see this even with myself. Sometimes I go in and I'm in a coaching cycle and I'm so focused on the teaching that I forget to look at the assessments with teachers or I forget to look at how they're planning. So sometimes even it's just human nature. You get hyper-focused on making one area better and then the other area kind of tends to um, decrease. <coughs> All right, we're gonna try this out. If I offend you, I am very sorry, but I felt like we needed to try this out on something realistic, and so I kind of dove into my mind and I said, okay, what are some of the situations I've encountered? Because if we don't practice on things that are real or we don't talk about what's the untalkable, um, you know, what we can't discuss, we're gonna make the undiscussable discussable today, we are not gonna learn how to do this. Yeah? Okay. So, um, anybody wanna read this for me? As a teacher? Salmon? Is that okay? <laughs> like that's, Salmon is struggling so much in class. I do not know what else to do. I make sure that I give him the easiest version of the assignments. I never make him do what the other students are doing. I try not to make him speak in front of anyone. If he can't do it, I make sure to help him. But then he gets to the test and he's just failing. Okay. So you go and you have to identify first what's the problem, okay? Protecting him from struggle is the problem, okay? So they're protecting him too much. They're making sure that he's never doing anything in the classroom. So then he gets to the test and he's never done anything and of course he's gonna fail, right? Because he's not done anything in the class but sit there <laughs> and maybe draw a picture, okay? So I got a problem with him being protected from struggle. I need to do some work in getting that teacher to expect excellence from my student, okay? I could give strategies, but the strategies aren't gonna help because the teacher doesn't believe that, there is ex that they can have excellence from my English learners. So until I make them believe that, no strategy I give them will actually help them. In fact, they probably won't take it because they believe right now that an English learner does the easiest form of work and they're coming from a very positive place. And I went in not thinking, well, why aren't you like challenging him? Why aren't you, I came in thinking, hmm, okay. Yeah, let's talk about that, okay. Yeah, tell me about what you're doing with him. I, I get curious first, I get the whole story, more so than maybe their brief version. Um, so I have to like help them find joy first. So maybe, 
I kind of talked to the teacher about him trying some other activities with other students first. Like, okay, like, let me help you find joy. So I'm gonna show you something that Salman did and how excited he was. So in my classroom, we just did a, like a constructed response to a text. And so he was really proud of it. He was able to write three or four sentences. And so I take that to the teacher and I say, Salman, uh, go ahead and give that to your teacher and tell her about what you did. He goes to the teacher and he's like, look, 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 teacher, I did this, I did this. I wrote three sentences, okay? Oh, that's great, wonderful. And then I follow it up with like, how did you see that? He was able to write three sentences. Isn't that so awesome that he's able to do that? Well, how did you get him to do that? Because he just draws pictures in my room. Okay, I'm getting them to see that there's joy in my student actually being challenged. So I'm shifting it. Okay, then I go on to what are they asking me now? Well, how did you do that? How did you get him to do that? Well, now I need to build up the ability of the teacher. I need to teach them to learn how they can do that. Oh, you know what? Like, where do you think he struggles the most? Where do you feel like he's not able to do the most? Oh, man, um, anytime we're speaking, I just tend to not call on him. Okay, let's, like, let's talk about like, some things we can do for speaking. Um, so, you know what, I'm going to try some things in my room, I'm going to see if he really responds to them, and then I'm going to share them with you and show you that they work. Let me try them out first, let me see if they work with him, even though I know the five things that work with him. Let me try them out first, I'm going to share them with you, and then, you know, if you think that's something you would be interested in, I'll give you about two choices, and you go ahead and tell me which one you want to try to figure out how to do with them in your class, and we'll figure that out together, okay? And then I got to give inspiration. So they tried it out and they're like, you know what? I tried out the one thing and it kind of didn't work. And I'm not sure what I need to do. Oh, but what did he do? Oh, well, he was able to say a few sentences and I was kind of proud about that, but he wasn't able to tell me the answer. Oh my gosh, you did awesome. You actually got him to talk a few sentences. You were just telling me the other day he wasn't able to say anything in your class. You know what? Getting the answer right, that's okay. I mean, you did great just getting him to talk. You're doing phenomenal. Let's talk about another thing. Maybe this will help him get the right answer. Okay, now you're getting them to find inspiration and you're praising them, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to keep doing this because, you know, hey, it's working and I'm doing great. Um, and then you give support. You know what? He goes to another classroom teacher that um, she was telling me the other day that he um, is talking in the math groups. So why don't you go talk to that teacher and see what she's doing? I think she was saying she was using some speaking stems um, that are working for her. So maybe you could try that with English. So, you know, maybe go talk to that teacher and see what that teacher's doing because she's having some success and I think she could really support you. So you're breaking the boundaries, you're creating a group that's all around him and him learning how to speak. Okay, and you're building a support structure for the teacher that's just not you. There's other people that can help you with this. Um, and I didn't go to incentives here, I just thought, well, if I change the environment and maybe we kind of meet in the library where it feels safer so she doesn't feel like I'm coming into the room and judging the room. You don't know, sometimes people don't like to be in their environment or they don't want you to come into their space. Um, so sometimes you need to change that up. So I was kind of getting the feel she was always keeping me at the door when we were talking and she wasn't quite letting me in the door. So I thought when, hey, when we meet, I'm gonna go ahead and just set up the meeting so when we chat in the teacher's lounge, cause that's like neutral space. And um, that way when we're talking about other teachers, it feels like it's the other, it's the space of the school instead of her space and I'm intruding on the space. Okay, kind of get what happened. Using all those things after a while, I guarantee you she's gonna start believing that he can speak and that when she does these things, it's really making him show that he has some excellence and that she can expect that from him and it's okay because she put the supports in place to support him. That he's not gonna shy away from her because the things are there that he needs. All right, wanna try it out? I gave you the hard one. <laughs> Anyone wanna read it? Because if I read it, I end up sounding a little bit negative. I can read it. Okay. Her name is Susan. She needs to read it. You're Susan? I, I am. Hi, Susan. Will you read it? <laughs> I do not understand why they place Susan in my class. 
She might need a different class because she does not speak English. Do you think she needs RTI or more ESL a while? Just until she catches up. In my class, she seems to not even try. It's like she's never been to school. You get that, right? Do you get it? I actually got it the other day. Usually it's when they're asking me about RTI. This is the scenario that I get. Um, by the way, her name, and I didn't add this, is Susanna. Not Susan, it's Susanna. Okay, so it might not be the problem that you think, but you know that her name is Susanna. <laughs> okay, go ahead and try it out with your partner. There's no right or wrong to this, guys. But you do need to figure out what mindset they're probably struggling with. Please remember that her name is Susanna. I don't know, but it bothers me. I want to say, yes. I think that's a sum. Okay, which uh, mindset do you think is the problem? Well, first, what's the problem? She doesn't know her name. <laughs> okay, she doesn't know her name. She doesn't even know her. She's not oh, even... Oh, the teacher said Susan, and oh, I didn't catch that I didn't either. Mm -hmm. oh. You gotta really listen, be curious. Okay, she said Susan. She doesn't even know her name. She just knows she doesn't speak English. Okay, so we're thinking that the problem is is that she doesn't really know the student. Is that the key problem, or does somebody think there's a different problem? I think it's obvious that, I know it sounds like this is a really crummy individual <laughs> saying this, but I hear a lot of fear. I hear they gave, they gave me a child I don't know what to do with. And I think, even though this sounds tough, it's really ripe with opportunity if you can, if you can be the right influencer to this teacher, you can really show her that there can be joy in having an ESL student in her class. You've, you've got two kids, two people that you're working on. Um, no, you're working on tons of students that that teacher will touch later if you can fix this one mindset, right? So she said that it sounds, and this is the key, you have to go in with positive intent. So you could focus on the RTI issue and you can be like, we just don't do RTI for e ELs. Until their third year, we don't do RTI. And you could answer with the RTI response. And you just missed the whole opportunity to like fix a mindset there. So maybe the problem is, is that the teacher has fear of what to do with beginner ELs. Okay, so maybe that's the true problem. They have fear, they don't know what to do with a beginner EL, they don't know, you know, maybe that. Maybe you see that they have a value problem because you've known this teacher a long time and that it doesn't matter if they're a beginner or an intermediate student, they kind of come to you with the same thing. So it kind of, you have to know the teacher and you have to get curious about the teacher. So um, again, no right or wrong answer. What mindset would you develop first? Would it be valuing the asset? Would it be reflecting on their practice? Or would it be um, expecting excellence? Valuing. 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 I hear valuing. Valuing. Um, maybe excellence. Maybe you're going to go about it the can-do route where you want to show them what they can do. Maybe uh, even reflecting, like saying, having them look at themselves and go, well, what, can, what am I doing to help the student learn about them? OK, well, go ahead and fill in in your box the mindset box, whichever direction you feel like you want to go. Do you want to go with valuing? Do you want to go with excellence? Are you kind of going to get them to be very reflective about what they are doing and how it affects the student? I think that I'm uncomfortable with the third one, even if I think that's part of the problem. Like, I feel like I would, I don't want to offend the, or be too pushy with the teacher. Do you know about their own? the way they view ESL. So I think even though I think that might be an issue, I might try to develop it first through that, the valuing the, or the excellence, like going through curriculum and then as we see some success, then also try to build that. I think that that other one will come along if, if you could show the value in the academic. Like, do you know what I mean? If you could, because that's kind of the, the complaint, right? Even though we see they didn't know the student's name, I think going at it from that way might 
I think you have more of an in to go in about it the other way first. She was saying like she felt more comfortable kind of working in the mindset and figuring out was, what was happening and then maybe she figured out that it was a skill problem and then she could develop that relationship of diving into the instruction. And I feel like that's a great strategy too. I had a high school teacher that came to me and said, um, my high school student just keeps telling me that they can't do any of the assignments in the class and so I want to talk to the teacher. What strategy could I share? And I said, you know, well, we just talked about mindsets. What mindset issue do you think they have? And they said, well, I think I want to like really look at um, maybe them believing that they can be excellent. I said, okay, well, how do you think you need to do that? And I said, he said, well, maybe I'll kind of go in and have the talk about the can-dos and show them that first and share that with them and then share some work. I said, okay, go ahead and try that. He came back and he said, you know what, guess what, I want to tell you what happened, Christine. I said, well, what happened? What happened with that teacher? And he said, he like sat, he said, hey, can we have a meeting? And he said, I've been looking at these can-dos and um, I think we need to start adjusting the assessment that I'm giving them. Because if this is what he can do, I don't think that that's fair to give him this assessment for history. And this is a high school teacher. Um, I think we could just assess on this part because this is the key idea and the other part is from the reading and it's not really necessary, I just kind of put it on the test, but if he could get this area and you could help him with that area, um, then I'll modify his test so all he has to do is that area. Okay, because he didn't go at the teacher with more strategies. He went at the teacher with, hey, like, I want to talk about Jose, and he's, he, this is what he's been telling me, and I want to help, you know, we want to help. So he went about it a different way, and he was using more than one cycle of influence. He was helping him find joy. He was helping him learn how. Um, once he saw the opportunity to learn how, he sat down with him, and he talked about how to differentiate the test. The test. Then he gave him praise for doing that. You know what? This is going to help Jose so much. You know, let me know what I can do to support you. Oh, well, if you could teach this one part, then I'll support you. You can help me and I'll help you by making sure that he knows this one key area of history. And then, um, you know, they, he got four, four influences in right there just by changing the way he approached the problem. So that kind of leaves you with an idea. So it, first you identify your problem, then you think about what mindset is really the driver here, what behavior do I need to change, and then what's, what sources could I start using? Which of these influences do I want to try first? Maybe I want to try two at the same time and see if that gets me some results. And then as I get more comfortable, I add in another layer. So um, my time is up, I hope that you developed a method to kind of navigate and influence teachers' mindsets around understanding ELs. Um, I hope that you developed an idea of what an influencer for change really is and the characteristics to that type of person. Um, I know we explored the mindsets that um, are needed for working with ELs, and I know that you got a few strategies or skills for influencing people that should help you navigate teachers through these mindsets. So thank you for having me today. I appreciate it, and hopefully you won't uh, run me out of here. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Christina. Um, uh, give me one minute of some quick feedback Give me some feedback from what you just heard. What will you take back to your classroom? What will you take back to your school? Quick, this is one minute. Um, I will, yes. I'm yes. going to make sure that I do uh, praise my teachers for when they are making the, uh, recognize them for making the changes and accommodations and helping my students. Great, yes. What, what district? Uh, Fayette County. Fayette County. I'm going to take back the part about the RTI time, having the kids with us versus them going to their other classrooms. Great. What else? What will you take back? What will you take back from what you heard this morning? Yes. What district? Murfreesboro City. Murfreesboro City. I liked the idea about creating interdependence, not just the teacher depending on me for input, but pointing him or her in other directions to other teachers. Peace. Great. What will you take back? Yes, what district? Williamson. Williamson. Yes, I'll take back that when I run into a problem, this will give me a starting place as to what to think about, to how to approach. The great, point. great. Maybe a new way to think about it. Yes. Yes, what district? 
Uh, Bedford County. Bedford County. Uh, encouraging them when they are doing the things that I have shared with them, even though they're not getting the full results, but praising that, bringing that out of them too, so they could understand that they are heading in the right direction. We never grow too old or too experienced to appreciate praise. What else will you take back? Someone else, what will you take back? Yes, what district? Uh, uh, Lincoln County. Lincoln County. Um, following up on your suggestions, I don't do too good with that. Following up, uh-huh. After making it once, then follow up. Great. Anything else? What else? What, yes, what will you take back, Murfreesboro City? Changing my mindset as how to approach or how to speak to the teachers, because so often, I think we, we are so protective and knowing we're their advocates, we have this, why, why aren't you doing that, that mentality of why, why can't you do this? You know, and making sure, thinking about more how I approach them and how I go forward with so working with teachers. So instead of what are you doing, the question is how am I looking at it and changing my mindset? Okay, great. What else will you take back from what you just heard this morning? Yes. From Murfreesboro City? Oh, uh, Williamson. Williamson. Um, is making the invisible visible, so then like sending back something you do to show an example of it, and then showing the success. Great, making the invisible visible, great. What will you take back from this morning? What will you take back? Yes, Williamson? Yeah, yep. that was so helpful to recognize it's not a strategy issue because the teachers that's what they think they're like give me a strategy give me a strategy but it's backing up to how are you thinking about the kid because the strategies will follow and not so. necessarily a strategy but a mindset yes 